But now I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, first of all, chairing the event, we have Chaparat Kaur Sandy, who established herself as one of the country's finest comedians in 2006 with her sellout Edinburgh show, Asylum Speaker, which led to the publication of her best-selling literary debut, her childhood memoirs, A Beginner's Guide to Acting English. This told the story of how her family were forced to flee Iran and gain asylum in the UK. Chaparek's one of um, a very recognisable face, I think, on TV and radio, so it's hard to name all of the shows that she's been in, but they include Mock the Week, 8 Out of 10 Cats, Have I Got News For You, QI, and numerous Radio 4 programmes as well. For her contribution to the arts, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from U uh, Winchester University, um, and she's also been the recipient of the prestigious James Joyce Award from Dublin University. Joining Chaparek is... Prof Keen swimmer. <laughs> There's also the driver. There was a driving note, I think, on your bio as well, which I found. Oh, that's great. That's good. <laughs> um, and joining her is Professor Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, um, who received his PhD from the University of Wales College, Cardiff, in 2000, um, and has worked as a lecturer in ancient history since then, first at Exeter University for 13 years, then the University of Edinburgh. Um, and where he was professor of Greek and Iranian history, and he returned to Wales six years ago, and um, where he's now professor of ancient history at Cardiff University. He's a director of Ancient Iran Programme for the British Institute of Persian Studies, and has travelled throughout Iran, the Middle East, and the classical world, leading cultural and archaeological tours. His research concentrates on history, the history and culture of Iran, um, but he works, also works on east-west relations in antiquity, monarchy, court, society, and the ancient world. His publications, previous publications, have been The Culture of Animals in Antiquity, King and Court in Ancient Persia, The Ancient Persia, sorry, The History of Persia, Tales of the Orient, and Designs on the Past, How Hollywood Created the Ancient World. His latest work, which is on sale now, but actually isn't released until next Wednesday, so grab yourself a, um, an early copy. It's called Persia, the Age of Great Kings. Um, and that's been hailed, and as I quote here, a masterful account and evocation of the history and culture of the first true world empire. And finally, um, on our panel, last but not least, we have Victoria Princewell. Victoria is an author, essayist, researcher, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She has an academic background that spans both the arts and scientists, uh, not scientists, sciences, and holds an MA in literature from Oxford, an MA in philosophy from UCL, and is currently completing another master's in neuroscience at King's College London. She's got bylines in The Guardian, Independent, um, Galdem, and the BBC and more. And her most recent essay, What's in a Name, um, for Granta magazine was endorsed by Penn Faulkner and deemed, and I quote here, best of the literary inter internet on Literary Hub. Her debut book, the Palace in the Palace of Flowers, which is on sale as a beautiful story, is a historical novel inspired by a real-life protagonist and tells the forgotten story of enslaved Abyssinians and um, black people living in the court of Iran who navigated the geopolitical landscape um, and rising nationalism ahead of Iran's first constitutional revolution. The novel has been named one of Times Radio's top five novels, novels of 2001 and was listed um, by African Arguments as the best best African novel of 2001 and has been lauded as, and I quote here, a compelling example of historical fiction at its finest, a book in which unpalatable humanistic truths and disquieting, disquieting historical details undergird a truly enrapturing story. So after that introduction, I will hand you over to Shafi. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I've been told I've got to use a microphone because um, just in case I say something interesting, just in case. Um, I think the worst thing for um, the chair of a panel is somebody who knows anything near what, what you guys know. And uh, thankfully, my qu only qualification for sitting here is that I happen to have had the great good fortune of being born in the geographical space. <laughs> that you guys um, show us so vividly. <laughs> um, and so, that said, I'm not a complete uh, novice. I, um, I remember the Persian boy 
being uh, by Mary Reynolds, mm -hmm. being at my mum's bedside uh, mm -hmm. book when I was a child, and I went to pick it up, and she goes, no, that's not for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course... I sneakily read it and learned far beyond what was appropriate for a child of, of that age. I was three, no. Um, and also in the Palace of Flowers, again, with the, the eunuchs, etc., which I won't be explaining to my daughter, who's in the audience. Um, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be talking with you both. And let's start with... Um, a question, what do we mean by Persia and the myths and preconceptions versus the reality? Persia, I think, is a, is a very difficult term to define. And as you'll know, you walk a tightrope when you use the word Persia and Iran. In my book, I kind of use them interchangeably because I refuse to get drawn into a debate. Mm. Um, it's not as simple as saying, um, Persia stands for pre -Islam, the pre-Islamic period and Iran for the Islamic period. It's not that at all. Uh, and these days within Iran, with a, uh, an increasing rise of a, a nationalist tendency, which is happening there, in fact, more Iranians are adopting the word Persia than ever before because they're looking back to a kind of glory days of the Achaemenid Empire and, and, and later uh, and, and seeing themselves as Persians. Since the 1979 revolution, um, emigres from Iran living in America and the West have very often adopted the word Persia because they see it as a more sophisticated way of alluding to their country uh, because Iran is often seen as, of course, the harbinger of terrorism, um, this very unpleasant regime, um, which indeed is, is there. Um, but the word Iran actually has four, far more cogency for me than, than Persia does. Persia was an invented word. It's a, it's a Greek word. Yeah, uh, part, well, it comes that, from... That was just the international Absolutely. Ones, Iranians Precisely. Have never... No. Um, so, you know, Iran comes from uh, the word uh, Iran, uh, which is a, definitely a Middle Persian word, so it's been around for, for millennium. Um, and people, you know, the ancient Persians saw themselves as Iran, or if you were not Iran, you were an Iran, or outside of Iran. Um, and I think there's, there's a, a pride to be had in that. Um, and yet there is also some kind of flavor that emerges when you use the word Persia as well. But um, I am not, uh, I'm not addicted to one more than the other. I will happily use the two. And can I ask you as well, like your, um, when you are discussing your book, do you tend to say Persia more than Iran and what, what I would, I would like to know what drew you to that particular place to set, set your novel. Um, and what are the, how would you describe Persia? Mm. This is one of those things where I'm first of all really glad you asked me a different question because I, ha I had an answer, but you never want to go after an expert. You're like, <laughs> what, what could I really say now? N nothing as useful. So thanks for the pivot. <laughs> but uh, no, I, would, I, I, I don't call it Persia, um, largely because, so, it, so it's interesting that the people that I often speak to today um, who are you know, contemporary Iranians, um, will describe using the word Persia um, as a kind of almost westernized, uh, more palatable, and to your point about the kind of flavor, there's almost a kind of remoteness, maybe exoticness, maybe it's far enough away you can project onto it. But um, in the period that I was writing about, they see it in, in the way that you describe where to use the word Iran is to reclaim a nationalist pride mm. at a time where, you know, th th there's all this foreign interference. There's what we call the great game. You have the British and the Russians selling off, uh, just, you know, having monopolies on, profiting from all of their resources. And it ultimately leaves the people feeling impoverished precarious, enraged, and quite, you know, xenophobic in a way. And um, 
Yeah, so in terms of what actually drew me to this particular period, um, and I was wittering away about <laughs> this to Lloyd before, whether he wanted to know or not. Um, <laughs> Basically, I, I came across in, in The Guardian... Can I just say, I was there, it was not Witter. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. She also has to say. But um, it, it, there's an academic called um, Pedram Kozvonjad, whose name I am mispronouncing. It's always awkward in front of someone who is actually Iranian. But um, he basically uncovered this uh, trove of like photography um, taken by the Shah at the time, so like the Iranian king, of um, his enslaved people. And they were all dressed in robes. They were all looking really sad. And they were black. And none of these things had I really expected to sort of encounter in one image taken by a king. It was all, you know, I was, I was going to say like a mind, and I can't, but it's a, it was confusing, it was surprising. It was the PC version of it. But it kind of set me on a, a journey, oops, okay. Uh, it kind of set me on a journey um, where I was, one, curious about where and how the black people got to Ilhan, because th there's a lot of, especially because I'm an old person, basically, which isn't to shame anyone old, it's to say that I lived in a pre-internet age, I'm 31, so your access to global history when you're young was pretty limited. And, you know, for any of you who are British, or most of you, there's questions you don't ask, you know, why is Africa so poor? Which doesn't actually shame Africans, but, you know, you wouldn't have to ask this. You know, uh, why are there no black people here, there, everywhere? And so discovering this, I was like, oh, okay. And then wanted to follow the story. And I wanted to be able to tell stories that took place in history that centered people that we, didn't, that we didn't assume had lived there. And to me, it's really important to start with history because I feel like when, when you tell stories that are set in the future, it has the, it, it almost seems kind of like compensation of a sort or, oh, we're trying to, you know, pander. Whereas I think when we tell stories that are steeped in history, we remind people of what's possible we broaden uh, their assumptions and kind of challenge um, the sense of what is out there. And we also have, a, have the capacity to almost write back people who have been erased from their own stories. Um, because, and then I will bring it to a close, um, it, it, it's no coincidence that we don't know these stories, right? There are narratives that are kind of ultimately forms of propaganda that are better served by eliding certain truths, right? So by bringing in all of the messy, broader existence of, you know, just all the different people that lived and how we allow people to rethink what they thought the world looked like and what is possible, you know, going forward. So that's my very, very long answer to that. It's, it's, it's the idea of um, reclaiming your own story that sits behind my book as well, because I'm, years ago, I, I read um, an amazing poem by, by Robert Graves, um, the great classicist, who uh, wrote a poem in 1942. It was called The Persian Version. And in it, he looks at the Battle of Marathon, which in the West has become mythologized as this moment where Europe is created. You know, We push back the Persian Empire, the Barbaroi, uh, who came from the East, and suddenly we become European, and we become a white civilization. And uh, Robert Graves, very correctly in that poem, says, well, really, was it like that? How did the Persians really think of this? And he comes up with the idea that really Marathon was just a little skirmish on the outpost of the great Persian Empire. And that really sort of stuck with me for these years. I've been teaching ancient Persian history for, for 20 years, but always with graves in the back of my mind. And what I've been trying to do, always in what I teach and now in what I've written here, is to privilege the Persian version all the time. So get away from the European narrative the Eurocentric approach to history, and to actually see that there is a major world civilization that was not necessarily clashing constantly with the West, but is part of the same dialogue with the West as well. Um, my, my sadness remains that I wish that within Iran itself, as you know, pre-Islamic Iran's history is a hot potato for the government there. And so therefore, 
pre-Islamic history is not taught well in Iranian schools, universities. To become an ancient historian of Iran for an Iranian, you have to come outside and study. Yeah. Okay. And what I want to see is Iranians, young Iranians, learning their pre-Islamic past and writing their own histories. That's my hope. And inshallah, it will happen. Because as the Persians say, you know, nothing, nothing stays the same forever. This too will pass, you know. Um, and that's what we need is, is an, that's, as far until we get there, yeah. I really hope that I'm giving the Persian version of the past. Uh, by the way, I'm stealing Persian version from my next comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> All these years, that hasn't occurred to me. Copyright, Lloyd Llewellyn Jones. <laughs> You can be in it. Yeah, be like this um, white dude trying to tell the Persian person. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I was going to ask both of you, because Iranians, Iranians, I love that you say Iranians, that is the correct way. Um, <laughs> Iranians um, who fled the, the regime, like, like me, mm. and scattered uh, mainly in, um, in London and Los Angeles and Paris, and I met some... Iranians in Melbourne when I did the Melbourne Comedy Festival and I said how come you ended up here and they went oh we couldn't get visas for yeah. <laughs> for America <laughs> or England um, because it wasn't by choice we tend you know we tend not to be well some obviously were economic migrants with the chance money but a lot of us were yeah. the writers and the artists and etc we my father I was only a child um, and so there is this um, tremendously protective attitude towards how we're perceived, which yeah. is why the Persia thing, I think, plays in, because so many people will ask, um, oh, so you speak Arabic, and they, they don't differentiate between yeah. Iran and <laughs> Arabic-speaking countries. And, um, and I wanted to ask you, because it must, be a, it must have been at times a minefield sort of navigating um, Iranian people's reaction to what you do because we think we are all experts by osmosis. <laughs> and so when actually somebody who isn't from Iran troubles themselves to travel there and learn um, from a historical point of view and look at the human stories that isn't Iranian, I wondered if you have come across a little bit of not what you want to be talking about <laughs> is this. Well, <laughs> so I have a heartwarming story and, and an interesting one. You're very diplomatic. <laughs> um, well, well, you know, it, it, it was very much in what wasn't said. But we can start with the, the heartwarming um, version, which, which is that there's um, a collective of black Iranians um, who I think they, um, they're pretty much based internationally, but they are people who often were born in Iran. Are, usually they have a parent who is um, Iranian and a parent who is um, black from outside of Iran. I, I will say, sorry to interrupt, but, um, oh, is it Fahima? Priscilla. Uh, and, um, she was, she could have been one she of the, was yes. Doctor yeah. Who's assistant. She's um, a mixed race girl whose mother is Iranian. I think her father is from Ghana. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, yeah. Very proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've, I've, I've fully got a list of every single possible black Iranian. I've <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I know who that is. I didn't watch it, but I know who she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was in Sense8 as well. It was great. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so in speaking with them, um, one of the first things that they, like, it was actually quite emotional, and they were like, they had not seen. Um, themselves in the story before mm. um, and I thought a lot about that because in telling the story I was motivated by wanting to tell stories that centered um, black people who got to be awful you know who and, and I mean that in a way that you know they got to have the full breadth of human experience told as the main character mm. as opposed to a caricature on the side and I knew how I felt impoverished um, in terms of what uh, literature was off, you know, available to me when I was young, I can't imagine having no stories. Mm -hmm. And so it felt a little bit like, you know, if, I don't know, you give someone, I don't know, a, a cup of tea because they're feeling stressed and they go, oh my goodness, this killed my cancer. And you're like, I I'm unworthy of the, like, <laughs> I'm not sure I even, okay. And it felt a bit like that, but, but I was also very, very humbled, grateful. The other story is that, um, and I'm, mindful that this is streaming, there's a particular New York Times journalist who read an article that I wrote um, 
in, in, in Grant Hill that, that talked about um, naming and histories and, and brought in some of the story and, and reached out to me because she was related to um, the, well, to the Shah, well, to the Shah and to um, obviously his, his, his daughter, um, Taj Sartanama, I'm also mispronouncing that. Um, and she was someone who I really relied on for um, a lot of research for the book. And she was really excited about my book and we talked a lot and then she read the book and then we didn't talk so much afterwards mm. because, like I said, it's a book that allows everybody the permission to be terrible, um, including, you know, the Kajars, her family. And, and so I think she was maybe less enthused and... I, I'm, yeah, I, I think yeah, that God. because um, since 79, uh, Iran and Iranians have been, uh, the, the people have been, and the culture has been so misrepresented. Oh. Um, I imagine, while I was reading your book, I, first thing I thought was uh, this thing that we Iranians feel that you should run it past all of us yes. <laughs> beforehand. Have you had a... Constantly, absolutely, oh. constantly. Yeah. So, there, there, you know, just a few incidents. And when I, when I go to Iran, and I've been lucky enough to go to Iran very often over the last 20 years, I've seen all sorts of permeations going on there, and I speak Farsi. And when I speak Farsi to people, the first reaction is they laugh in my face. But no, it's not because they simply they cannot believe that anybody outside of Iran has ever bothered to learn Farsi. Uh, so it's a kind of nice thing, really. And then I explain, you know, I'm a historian, and then they become all sort of sentimental, and then, <laughs> then, <laughs> the list of must-haves <laughs> comes out, okay? So there are some things that, you, you know, you, you uh, are non-negotiable. Cyrus the Great yeah. is a non-negotiable, okay? He was the creator of human rights, yeah. right? The Cyrus Cylinder. So the Cyrus Cylinder down in the British Museum, this, this lump of clay, which was found in Babylon, written in Babylonian language, it actually has nothing to do with Iran whatsoever. It's a purely... Right, thank okay. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, we're going, and now we're going to commercial. So, <laughs> so it's a, a document which was written as a piece of propaganda for when Cyrus conquered Babylon, he presents the conquest as a liberation, okay? Like the first Gulf War, it's Operation Liberation Babylon, mm. okay? So the Babylonian priests write this document for him in which he is um, a follower of Marduk, the, 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 the great god of, of Babylon, who chooses Cyrus, you know, he calls him from afar and says, come on, he takes Cyrus's hand and walks him into Babylon as this liberation, a liberator figure. Now, that has been so mythologized that it's been made into a great Iranian document, of course, to begin with, okay? So back in 2009, um, a, a real diplomatic coup uh, occurred when the British Museum agreed to loan the Osiris Cylinder to Tehran, to the uh, Bastan Museum, yeah, National Museum, and uh, it was on an extended loan, and there were queues around the blocks for months and months and months, curiously, to look at this object, which actually has no Iranian identity to it at all. Step back. <laughs> 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 and what's happened is there are so many fake translations of this document on the internet which say things like, um, I am Cyrus, I will never hold my people to ransom, I abhor slavery, you will all have the rights of being humans wherever you are, no religion will be imposed upon you. It's not there. Ancient it is simply ancient fake news, it's simply <laughs> not there. But you know, it, it's so persuasive mm. that Shirin Abadi, when she received her Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. she quoted a bogus translation and she was mortified when she found out. Well, wouldn't you say that um, a similar thing has happened with Magna Carta? Yes, yes. And so that might not have been the original intention. However, that myth is sort of created in good faith. I agree, I agree. And I think that I am happy for it to run because it gives Iran an identity. It gives something to hang on to. And there is no doubt in my mind. As long as you stop talking. About it. <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt in my mind that Cyrus the Great is a, 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 an individual deserving of the title, the Great, okay? Yeah. He was an amazing man. Of course, the other thing which the Iranians have to come to face with, come to terms with, is that empire building 
is pretty much a bad thing. And regardless of how we go about doing it, there's always going to be bloodshed and square-jawed soldiers doing pretty awful atrocities as you go. So the Persian Empire is built on violence. However, it was maintained on a, in a way which was quite diametrically opposed to other ancient and more recent world empires. Um, and I always take as an example Rome and, and Britain because these two empires are so intertwined in the, in the way that they've, they followed one another. Um, the Persians, unlike the Romans, never, for instance, inflicted um, uh, a language policy on its peoples, you know, so there was no compulsion to speak Persian. Um, there was no religious um, imposition whatsoever. And in fact, the Persians attempted in their empire to have a sense of harmony, to, to actually recognize the different peoples of its empire as they are. And what's fascinating about Persia, as opposed to, you know, if you go to a Roman site anywhere in the world, you can, you know, you might be in Syria or in Hadrian's Wall, you will notice it is Roman because it's Roman architecture. It's implanted on the landscape. The Persians never did that. They took the best of the architecture and the art from across their empire and brought it back into Iran to make something which we now call Persian. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the remarkable difference in this. And you see, I, I, one of the points I make in the book, and I wish I could have been stronger in the book, but my editor said, oh, pull it back a bit, uh, is to criticize, I do criticize a little bit about the, the, the English school system, um, the private school system in which classics has been so held as the benchmark um, to what you know, great learning should be. And we see it in our own beloved prime minister, of course, who uses his, and I have to say, mangled Greek and Latin <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to, as a kind of form of social distancing. You know? Greece and Rome, the empire, you know, first of all, the Greek miracle, and then the Roman expansion of empire was the model for the British Empire. And how sad it is that the Persian past wasn't taught in our schools. Empire is never a good thing, but the British Empire actually could have had another model of how to work, and at least would have assured that the peoples of the empire had more dignity than they actually had under the, the Roman model, which was followed. And I think that's the exceptional thing that the Iranians should be proud of. Mm. It's another way of empire. As ugly as empire is, I would rather have been under the Persians than the Romans. Yes, no one's ever tickled into no. submission. And I've always found that interesting, you know, growing up in... In, um, in, in Britain and being Iranian and having my, my um, adopted, you know, my, my motherland and my adopted land both <laughs> like empire yeah. mentality. It's been, it's been quite a trial. <laughs> um, but um, what I was going to say just very briefly was that's really interesting what you say about how the, again, going back to the Cyrus... Cyrus Cylinder, because Iranians relate to that. They relate to the idea of not imposing your religion or your language on people. And we're such a mishmash of people. And just, um, what, and that really is, is uh, present in the culture mm -hmm. of Iranians. Like when I was at school, my Indian and Pakistani mm -hmm. friends had such restrictions over who they marry, for mm -hmm. example, because they come from a place of religion. Whereas, you know, we, we're not, not like that. And, uh, friend of mine worked for a housing association, refugees, and he said, the only refugees that never say, I won't live with someone from this country, or I won't live with someone from that country, is Iranians. Mm -hmm. So I'm just basically telling you that we're incredibly <laughs> intolerant people. I think it's because, I agree with you entirely. <laughs> you're, you're going, yeah, finish my book, love. <laughs> I think it's because, you know, um, after the great empires of antiquity, you know, and then the, the conquest by, by the Arabs and the Islamization, essentially Iran then becomes the crossroads yeah. of conquest, okay? Everybody's coming in, yeah. Mongols, Turks, everybody's coming yeah. in. Yeah. But what's remarkable is that Iranian culture conquers them all. They all become Persianized, essentially. We feed Isma them into yeah, absolutely. submission. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you, you actually do. feed them into submission. But it is the strongest culture, wins out each time. And I think that's a remarkable thing about it. You can't argue with our food. <laughs> I mean, this is true. I, it's pretty really spectacular. It. Um, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself, <laughs> which, is, which is the Shall main we'll thing. Um, I'm going to have another look at my questions. 
And um, yes, let's talk about kings, if we may, Lloyd. Um, so your book covers a huge period of history. And can you please pick out two or three kings and tell us how they shaped the empire? We've covered some of this already. Um, we've talked about Cyrus the Great and Darius and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say... The proper Iranian word for Xerxes is Khashoyar Shah. Khashoyar Shah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I was really debating whether I should use the Persian names, Daravayush, <laughs> instead yeah. of Darius Khashavasha, instead of Xerxes. But I thought, oh, I better not, because, you know, fortunately I read the audio book, but I mean, <laughs> I was thinking of some yeah. for, for well, narrator. Well, I know. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> yeah. Um, Three-year-olds called Khashoyar. Yeah. Said, wow. Um, but also, just with, within the context of the kings, if you tell us about the palace city of Persepolis. Yes, of course. Well. Yes. I think that um, Darius, Darius the Great, actually is in, again another another individual worthy of the title. Um, he was one of the great sort of administrator kings. Um, he was a great bureaucrat. That's what he loved. Nothing was too remote from him to to dot an I or cross a T. Um, he was obsessed with bureaucracy. And because of that, really, he, gave, he gives a kind of structure to the empire. And don't, under Darius, the empire is at its, its biggest. So the center there is, is southwest Iran, around the city of Persepolis. But the empire reaches right the way out to the coast of North Africa, to Libya, right the way down the Nile to Ethiopia, and then across into the steppes of Russia and into Pakistan. I mean, it is the biggest world empire ever seen. Alexander of Macedon adds a little bit to it, but really it was the biggest empire the world had ever seen. And what Darius does brilliantly is to give cogency to all of this by constructing incredible road net networks, some of which really are, 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 have survived across the centuries. You know? So if you could get from Sardis in Turkey to Susa in Iran in about 17 days, for instance, riding on a kind of Pony Express, you, know, you could get messages around all the time. Um, he issued um, uh, a dictum where the, um, the, the international language of the empire was Aramaic, which is a kind of uh, Semitic language which Jesus was still using. And that became, like Latin in the Middle Ages, the, the common language of all bureaucracy. So you were able to communicate with each other. And, you know, we have these, these tablets written in cuneiform which show that people journeyed across this whole empire um, and given provisions as well, so like service stations everywhere mm. to uh, pr uh, allow this. Well, one incredible um, text says that a woman with a translator guide travels from Memphis in Egypt to Kandahar in Afghanistan. This is truly an international empire. Mm. And of course, they're using the seas as well. Darius has all this. One of Darius's great feats was to cut a canal from the Red Sea to the Nile so that he could actually get Egyptian goods and the grain from Egypt right the way around the Red Sea and into the Persian Gulf that way as well. So, I mean, he was a phenomenal individual. His son, Xerxes, is, uh, is famous for being a bad king. Um, and that, of course, is the Herodotean take on it. You know, he's been much maligned by um, Herodotus. And what I've tried to do um, in the book is to liberate Xerxes from this, this, this catalogue of catastrophes that... Um, the father of history, father of lies, uh, <laughs> tells about him. Um, it's really hard because when it comes to um, a, a Persian account of the, of the Greek wars, you know, the Greco-Persian wars, we simply don't have one. And I think that's because they were of very little consequence to the Persians who had bigger fish to fly elsewhere. But I've tried as best I can to give, okay, taking Herodotus' account of Persian advance into Athens and the defeat of Athens and then the ultimate um, defeat of Persia and the setback, how would the Persians have understood this, you know? And to many, in, in many accounts, you know, the, the idea of, of Thermopylae, you know, the 300 who were killed, you know, defending the past there, the Spartans. Well, for, 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 for Xerxes, that would have been mission accomplished because he killed the, the Spartan king, who was clearly a follower of what Xerxes would have called Drauga, the lie, mm. which was the opposite of Arta, to be, uh, which is truth. And in the religious system of, of the Achaemenids, who are kind of proto-Zoroastrians, they believe in this duality. There is Arta, truth, and there is lie, Drauga. And truth means loyalty, um, um, giving due service to the crown uh, and to the king and to the gods. So when people rebel against that, they become liar kings, they become followers of the lie. So when Xerxes ha kills Leonidas at the, the pass of Thermopylae, as far as he was concerned, that was it, mission accomplished. You know, he's killed the liar king. So I'm trying to read the Persian version into these 
very grand old Greek narratives that we are so obsessed with and have been building blocks for our um, civilization. And likewise, the, the final king I mention is right at the end of the dynasty is Darius III. So he's the guy who has to go up against Alexander of Macedon. Uh, I notice I do not say Alexander the Great. <laughs> and I think he was one of the biggest vandals in history. Um, but Darius III has, because of the classical tradition, been so downplayed, you know? It's as though he, he flees from the Battle of Issus, flees from the Battle of Galgamela. Well, it's not about that. What he was trying to do every time he saw that his forces were being defeated was to take himself out of battle so that the dynasty could survive. It was only going to survive through the king himself. And he was always ready to fight another battle. So far from being a coward, which comes over in the classical sources, Darius III was actually a very pragmatic soldier and a very good leader, in fact. Um, but trying to habilitate that, it's been a kind of uphill struggle for me and, and colleagues who are like me, who, who try to look for the Persian version each time. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just go on to the Victoria's bit now because, and, and also I need to ask you something, I need to ask you so much. <laughs> um, so your book, Victoria, is a work of fiction, but it draws on the only first person account of an enslaved Abyssinian in Iran. And I wanted to ask you about that and also to tell us about the trans-Saharan uh, slave trade. Again, something you never want to do when there's like an Iranian expert in the room. Um, but no. Uh, I do feel intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he doesn't know that oh, much. Him. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're right. I mean, it could have two. Goodness. No. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say is so in the Palace of Flowers um, is literally, I mean, the phrase like Palace of Flowers comes from Galeston Palace, which is where it's set. And it is basically taking this sliver of what we could call an autobiography, but it's so, it's so small and so slight um, that, it, that, that, that it feels quite too bereft to even, to even be one. Um, but, but takes the autobiography of the real life Jamila Habashi um, that she wrote in 1905. And at the time, it was certainly very rare and at the time the only available um, piece that certainly was in English that you could find if you weren't literally in Iran. Um, I think only ever is the, the obsessive with accuracy of me is like someone's going to come out and go, there was like 80 of them here. So, but, but I think in Farsi, very much um, discouraged from being accessible because they clash with this narrative that um, Iran had slaves because they didn't, you know, they didn't. This book is all lies, they didn't. Um, you know, but, but so basically I, I felt the story, as I said, I, I came across in a lot of photography, um, these images of these black slaves and until I came across this autobiography, I don't think that I felt I had a, a story or a hook or an individual character that I could really kind of connect to. It was a young woman. It was actually, she actually wrote it in, I think, 1905. So it was just um, around the same time as the first constitutional revolution. And I pulled it back to 1895 and I put her in the palace where, to my, to my knowledge, she actually wasn't. But I wanted to tell this story because not only were Abyssinians enslaved, they were also prized of the you know, various types of um, African slave that you would have um, in the Kadra court. And I thought to myself, okay, if she has access to education and she's not worried about um, you know, dying for any sort of arbitrary um, infringement of any sort of mile, you know, she, she, she has a relatively stable life at that point. And at the same time, there's this rising nationalism that is actually penetrating the harem and is, you know, going to influence even the things that they hear, even when they go out into the bazaars. What it, it was almost the question that I that I have as like a person born to immigrant parents who had a lot more time to navel gaze than my very practical parents who just kind of got on with stuff. And I thought, well, what was she, what was she thinking in all this time? Like, you know. You're listening to people talk about um, you know, Iranian nationalism, and you aren't you aren't Iranian. Your family is how far? Like, does any of this penetrate? At which point? And I wanted to kind of tell a story that 
did more than the autobiography because there's so little that you can't even imagine. It's just, I was born here to these tribes and sold to these men. And I was sort of like, is this all the only autobiography actually tells us? And yeah, and so that was the, the jumping off point. The, the Trans-Saharan slave trade, to me at least, is fascinating because it was so far from anything that I understood about slavery. It, it was very, very much, t at least what I read, very tied into religion, um, into Islam, and th there were all these sort of, um, I guess, colorism sort of gradations of like Mombasans versus, you know, Zanzibarians versus Abyssinians, and who was a domestic slave and who was, you know, a concubine who could be a temporary and all these different um, things. And it, it, it was surreal in, in, in the way it really transformed my understanding of what slavery is, but even what it, what I guess it means to, to own someone. Because on one level, you know, there would be stories of slaves who inherited money when their masters died, who, you know, got to wear robes quite literally, who had photos taken of them, who lived relatively like they had, you know, freedom. There's some story of a, a freeman who runs off with, you know, some governor's daughters. You know, there's, there's all these stories that imply agency, that imply autonomy, things we can understand, but these people are still ultimately owned by another person. And so, you know, and I was just thinking briefly back to what you were um, saying about the sort of, the, the, the sort of, forgive me, kind of fraudulent narrative that people kind of reclaim as their own. And I think, well, what are the narratives that we tell ourselves about how we sit in the world? This is ultimately at, at the crux of all the stories I want to tell and, and why I found even paying attention to the trans-Saharan slave trade, even, you know, thinking about what it is to live in a royal palace, to to have your body be owned so you are effectively subject to someone's whim. Mm -hmm. You may not be experiencing harm because they're not necessarily brutal every day, but maybe they are tomorrow. And I, I was conceiving of them almost the way you see a child with their toy. Sometimes they care for it, sometimes they throw it to the side. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately the extent to which their bodies could be you know, treated in a particular way. It's not, it, it's not about sheer brutality all the time, but it is about almost, you know, there's a lot of standing around playing at being invisible. And what does that do to a, to a self? You know what I mean? To just kind of have to almost subjugate yourself within your own body every time you engage with other people. Mm. And it, even the stuff about the eunuchs, I, I had to speak to this, um, this academic who's an expert in castration. Mm. I do not know what leads someone to that career, but you know, <laughs> it served me well, put it that. And uh, it was genuinely a more horrifying story than I could have imagined. There's a lot of different types, but the castration that they went through, literally, they were just, it was just all cut away and there was like a 75% death rate. Mm. You know, the, the, the sort of like ex-consultant in me was like, this is not an efficient way of doing anything. Why would people carry on 75%? Like, what, who thought this was a good idea? But you know, what does that look like to be in this space with 75% of the people around you dying before you're all sold up? You know, there's all of this, um, you know, again, is is ripe with ripe with story, which makes me sound like a vulture. But you know, there's there's, and again, to your to your point about you know wanting to change the kinds of uh, whether it's sort of like the Westernized or just sort of Greek narratives, I think, and I was saying I was saying this to you earlier that there's often you know an emotional incentive f f for me. It, it, it's far easier to relate to or want to see some sort of broader change in the world you live in if you're harmed on some level by by the lack of change. But I think there's also like an intellectual and a creative case for it. it it's so impoverished to just have the same very narrow mm -hmm. stories over and over again and the same way of looking at things. I, you know, if we have one more pride and prejudice zombie, whatever bloody story, I swear, I'm gonna like <laughs> you know, just set something on fire. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just like, come on. You know, there's, and I think there's so many things we're missing when we ignore huge, uh, swaths of the population and all the intricacies of the stories that, that yeah that could exist and that's way off what you actually asked me but you know trying to uh, trying to access women I think in in my that as well, a phrase was, is was, like was really <laughs> is really hard <laughs> <laughs> trying to access women like never have those words get together without something for like forgive me continue what you're saying because <laughs> of course in, in ancient Persia we have concubinage as well you know and basically it's sex trafficking is what is going on there. Yeah. And how the empire itself is kind of played out through the ownership of the bodies of others, of eunuchs, of, um, of these harem women. Um, 
But what, I, what we need to do, and I think your book does it really well, is to resist the Orientalist um, temptation to locate these women in a world of sultry pleasure. You know, they're just on scatter cushions, um, in their harem outfits with, with Persian kittens, you know, waiting for, um, you know, the sexual adventures in some sultan's bed. Um, and what I've certainly revealed about the harem, and I think it's the right word to use for me um, within the Achaemenid period, although we don't know what the Persians actually called it, um, is that it, it was really the domestic space of the, of the whole empire. And what happened in this domestic space had reper repercussions throughout the empire. So when a wife went head to head with another wife, because kings were polygamous, for the rights of succession for their sons, that played out in the, in, across the whole empire. So, you know, f for me to dismiss the harem as a kind of brothel-like pleasure palace is to completely misunderstand the role of women in the courts of, of Persia and other ancient and more contemporary societies as well. So I take yeah. them very seriously. So how would that play out, that power structure in, a, in, a, uh, in the Qajar court? Um, can you explain to me how that power structure would would, yeah. would work um, mm. when it came to oh uh, hello sorry <laughs> when it came to um, concubines yeah so, so within most Persian courts across the centuries at the, at the top is the king's mother because while a king could have many wives and even more concubines he can only ever have one blood mother and of course she connects then the generations as well. So, you know, the, the, her son's generation with his father's generation. So she reigns supreme. And basically many of these queen mothers, they can have their separate estates, they have their own wealth. Um, you know, they, they're not sort of enshrouded necessarily. They can be political movers and operators, even though they don't have an official title. You know, there's no, there's no sort of um, role for them. But of course, it's just their proximity to their son which gives them this, this kind of title, this, this, this prestige. And they often rule the Hari more like a convent or a finishing school than anything else. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know. Below that, you'll have the wives. Now, in the Islamic period, you have four wives. But in the pre-Islamic period, in my era, you could have as many wives as you want. And we know that Darius I had at least six consorts. Mm -hmm. And then below that, there are as many concubines as you want. There's no limit to these. And concubines are... Um, brought into the palace for, for many reasons. Sometimes as they're trained as entertainers, dancers, musicians, as secretaries, um, uh, learned women, but often they become as well um, sexual partners. And sometimes they never even see the king at all. You know, they're simply part of the furniture. Um, concubinage is not a dormant position though. And we have several occasions in Persian history where the mother of a, of a shah was a concubine. So just because of, you know, accident of history, the Shah happens to, to like one particular woman, um, he, she begets a son, and there's no primogeniture in Persian history either, so it's not an automatic that the first son um, no, succeeds. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's, then a, it's, it's, it's game on. And basically, it's the power that a woman can have in bringing together other courtiers, eunuchs to work alongside her, other women, that really will force her son into the position of, of primacy. Yeah. And that's what every woman wants because that is safety because then she becomes the queen mother. And in oh, the... It's like trying to get your kid into... <laughs> <laughs> high school. But no, in, 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 the, um, in the Qajar, which I'm definitely mispronouncing, uh, dynasty, at least the, the period that I'm looking at in the book, it, it was really interesting because you had about... I mean, you had, I think, maybe about six um, actual wives and um, I, I can't pronounce the the worst I'm not going to, but proper wives, and they ultimately came from um, noble backgrounds. Um, and, and the Shah had, had, had done this thing where, as you say, there's, there's, there's no sort of, you know, firstborn, whatever, but there was, I don't know what's happening with my mic, I feel like it's not me. Oops. You're okay. Anyway. Okay, but, but there was a thing where ultimately, you know, the, the next in line had to, had to be from a noble family, so that affected things instead. So the Shah had chosen a particular wife, um, Jaywan, she was initially um, a concubine, and then she was killed with it. We don't know who, most likely by the other women in the house, like arranged and had her killed. And then the two children she had were also killed. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, he had tried to make what was uh, like a, a temporary wife, what they're called, into a sort of noble wife. And you'd have all these, um, all these machinations. That, 
it was fascinating how much I ended up having to keep out that was also stranger than fiction, where I was kind of like, I, wow, they, I mean, they literally would, they, they, they would murder each other to, you know, to stay on top. They, they, it, it, it was really quite fascinating. And, and yeah, that, that, that was just the added distinction I wanted to bring in because it, it was the one moment where the Shah tried to actively kind of transform the way in which the sort of official hierarchy would go, where the, you know, if, if there was a fixed rule, it was that at least, you know, it had to be a child from um, a noble family on one side and he had a penchant for like, you know, sort of like um, village girls, shall we say, for his temporary wives, so they weren't going to whatever. And um, it, it was incredibly interesting in this way because like I said, the, the Shah's daughter had this autobiography that was kind of casually informative in ways you just could not get anywhere else. Like the deep down details of what the different houses and um, that the mother of um, the Shah and the people just, just had outside of the actual um, harem and the way it was kind of run like a, I mean, you know, he had about 80 temporary wives and then all these other women in the house. It, it was itself, you know, to your point about how ultimately limiting and false the, the orientalist narrative is, it, it, it's basically like a, yeah, like a convent, like a school, like a, like a business, like an entity. There's so much work to be done. They're not just lining up to sort of, you know, sleep with the king. Um, they're often also having relationships with each other and not in the kind of eroticized, you know, sort of just in the way adult women will, will do. And so there was a particular game called Lights Out where he, he enjoyed playing this game. He made, you know, turn off all the lights and everyone, you know, king, prince, slave, whatever, there are no rules, you can do whatever you want. And um, the daughter recounts being choked by people at various points and people attempting to get, and just anything is happening, rape, map, whatever, and then they put the lights back on and you all have to, and you're just like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's his fun. Mm. All right, and it's all these well, you know, it's, surreal it, things. It's so easy to read that, wouldn't it, as uh, through an orientalist lens, you know, and say, oh, these decadent Persians. Mm, mm. But I'm willing to take very seriously, you know, this is absolute monarchies that we're dealing with yeah. all the time, and they rule absolutely. And I don't think there's any difference, really, in the stories that emerge from, I don't know, we could call it the court of Stalin, or of um, Saddam, or of Putin. That's any different, really. You know, absolute monarchies rule with absolute authority and do the most bizarre things. Yeah. And truth is stranger than fiction, very yeah. often. Absolutely right. I think he's just often not getting to read them, mm. and, you know, from his mm. daughter, because... And it's a good point about um, the Oriental, Orientalist uh, lens there, because to me, what I just got was her fear. She was just kind of, horrible. you know, she, if someone had successfully killed her, that would have been it. Mm. And on they would have gone. And it's sort of, how is this? And yeah, we don't, we don't really spend a lot of time really entertaining what it is to, to have that kind of absolute control. Mm. And uh, no, un unless we're pointing at some aberrant country over there or something. Mm. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's fascinating. It certainly is, and we're going to go to um, have some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to give you a minute to compose one. <laughs> so you to compose yourself. <laughs> compose one. But just very quickly, before we do that, can I just ask you a quick question? So I did a show once about Emma Hamilton, Horatio Nelson, the love of Horatio Nelson's life. And it was, um, you know, I picked the bits that I enjoyed more, the most that I could put into my um, show. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, what was your biggest challenge and perhaps, or and positive about taking real historical figures, uh, real, real people in history and kind of fictionalizing them? What was, a, what was a big challenge on that and what was a positive? So the big challenge, I guess, was, was making sure that um, I kept a kind of, like I'm born in you know, what we call the West. I will have organically like a, Western gaze, right? So even when you think of slaves, you think of freedom. So even my notion of what freedom would look like, I had to really make sure I was kind of divesting um, the importance I would give to a very liberal 21st century notion of like autonomy and agency, which isn't to say they didn't entertain ideas of freedom, but I had to really contextualize um, what I wrote and, and, and think about what they would think was possible. What would they be? Um, and, and what was fun in that regard, I guess, you know, all the people were dead, so I could sort of, you know, be a bit, uh, and not worry about libel. Um, but no, um, <laughs> but but no. Also, I guess taking po poking fun at things. I think you know when you when you live in a culture, when a culture is your own, you can kind of you're more comfortable mocking it, especially if it has the kind of power that uh, Western soft power does. And so 
the fact that the Shah is this avid Europhile, I thought to myself, would all the wives be as well? Probably not. Maybe they think it's a bit ridiculous. Maybe they're kind of a bit like him and his, you know. I, I think of even, you know, with my own family and uh, what it is to, for them to, you know, they've grown up on a very different continent. They've had their own cultural history. And so how they view Western art is so different from how I do. And so I wanted to create that kind of insular um, space that, you know, th there's a moment where I think, because in real life, the, the Shah's son um, moved to Paris and actually wanted to be a painter when he died and was buried in Paris. And he's talking about it in the book. Um, and uh, the, the, Jim Miller is sort of like, oh, what, what's Paris like? Is it, is, it, is it as beautiful as Tehran? And they're like, no, of course not. You know, and, and it's just me kind of playing with, I mean, I was in Paris last week, it's stunning, but I mean, if you, I've, I've not been to Tehran yet, I blame Trump, but you know, <laughs> if you look at it and you'll be able to tell us better, it, it's, so, like the, the, the architecture, the McCann, I just think, well, yeah, they, they, they wouldn't think that the sandstone that we love is all that, you know? And, and just being able to kind of like invert my own um, biases and things, um, that was a bit fun. Thank you. Shall we go to Q&A? Yes. We will have a Q&A. Mm. Questions and answers. Ah, thank you so much. Um, Right, so we have viewers online um, also. Hello to those online. And so here is a question. What are Victoria and Lloyd's single favorite sources when researching and writing about Persian history? Are you going to say, well, apart from your own? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it comes to um, ancient sources, what I've tried to do is privilege, as I say again, the, the Persian stuff all the time. So that's hard because the Persians didn't write narrative histories. It's not part of the Persian tradition. I think um, it was transmitted in song, in poetry, but that hasn't come down to us. And this is why there's this Western dominance because you know the, 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 it's as though the, the West invents history writing. Um, but I, I, you can access the Persian world in so many different ways, um, so, but you have to use everything. So royal inscriptions, these cuneiform um, ration lists, um, you have to use the architecture, the archaeology, the iconography from across the whole empire. So it's like working with a glorious jigsaw puzzle. Um, but frustratingly, there are lots of pieces missing, and usually around the edges in particular. Um, but you have to use everything. And that's both a challenge, but also very liberating as well. Um, when it comes to actual, you know, um, other historians who have worked on Persia, I'm glad to say in the last 30 years, Persia has been given its proper place in, in ancient historical studies. Uh, and I'm really indebted to the work of people like Pierre Briand, uh, who is the kind of great grandfather of, of Persian studies. He's a French-based scholar. Emily Kurt, who's here in London, who has combined incredible source books of, of materials. So the, the, the groundwork is being done. But what we in my generation, and I hope the, the next generation, the, the students I'm teaching now, are going to do is to take Persian history, be bolder with it, and start approaching Persian history from different ways. I want to have gendered readings of, of Persian history. Um, I want to have ethnic readings of Persian history. I want to have bottom-up readings of Persian history. And I think that's all possible now that we've, we've got to this stage. We're a long way behind you know, classics and stuff. We're a, you know, we're a very new discipline really, um, but it's, it's all out there, and I think we can be bold and challenging with what we do with it. Thank you. How about you, Victoria? I mean, like, isn't Lloyd great? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously? Um, I was really nervous I was saying this before because it's like being in year seven and going to like meet someone who's a professional writer and go, hi, <laughs> you know, like, and, and he's just um, very gracious, obviously, but also has a really, really just valid and, and crystallized mission which I'm, mission always sounds a bit radical, but I'm very behind just like rigorously kind of like recognizing all the deficits that we have currently. And um, to answer the question, um, so obviously uh, Pedram uh, Kozvinjad, um, really funny, but once um, we started speaking when I finally plucked up the courage, having worked with other um, academics, so Anthony Ailey in particular, um, is a huge debt to, I did not tell any of these people I was writing a novel when I first sought them out, I was just like, ah, I'm, interested in and you know as, as we can see academics are really generous with their with their knowledge with their research um but when i did and then i think it also got reported in some iranian newspaper um then pedram sort of gave me access to all these um 
all, all, all these drives and all these files and all these photos mostly that can't be, uh, well, well, he can't publish them because he won't be allowed back in Iran. Um, and it was just this incredible window into, well, again, how, how, how photography for one is a really, really vital medium for, for what we understand to be history, what we understand to be research and storytelling and how we, how we make sense of, of what things look like, how we understand them. But also actually a lot of, um, a lot of kind of academic secondary material because, and this isn't, just, I'm not answering the question, it's not a single favor source, but for me, I think it's, you're so often going to be looking at something with all of your own kind of like biases, you know, all of your own preconceptions. So for me, it's sometimes good to have a kind of secondary framing that will shape it somehow, whether I want to agree with that, disagree, engage with that, it will help crystallize things that I, a, a way of seeing it, which then helps sharpen my own. So I think we're like, like uh, toggling between the two, being able to look at this kind of primary um, research and visual research from um, Pedram and being able to look at more kind of like scholarly um, assessments. Um, and even, you know, some of the more, you know, Vanessa Martin and, and, and people like that who've, 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 who've written, you know, who, who've touched on um, in broader books, they've, 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 they've touched on narratives around, um, around slavery in Iran. What was really interesting is when I, by the time I finished reading my book, there was actually a, a lot more of it coming out, which I am shamelessly going to say is, you know, my influence, even though the book wasn't out somehow. But yeah, part of me was like, this should have been here when I started, but yeah. Thank you very, very much. And I wanted to ask you, this is from a question from me. <laughs> I know that you um, adv had, have advised uh, filmmakers on the historical accuracy of the mm. films they're making. Did they come to you for 300? Oh, no. I've oh, thank Oh, <laughs> no, no. I wish they had. <laughs> I've, um, <laughs> I've written several articles on that movie, that, and, and, it, and well, the two movies. And its hideousness. I mean, it, it is the most dis destructive film. Um, I've had lots of Iranians writing to me over the years, asking me to defend them from the movie. And so I did. Uh, I recently published an, an article called Trouble in the Tehran Multiplex, which is about the Iranian reaction within Iran um, to that. So reading through Iranian reviews, Iranian newspapers, I, was, I just wanted to gauge what the Iranians were saying. And you know, what comes up time and time again is this idea that the Achaemenid period, we may not know much about it, they say, but we know it's our glory period and, and, and don't do this to us, mm. is essentially it. You know, there, there was some such horrific rhetoric used when that film came out. Um, Frank Miller, um, who created the original um, graphic novel, he once said that, um, alluding back to 9-11, to he said, we know that those planes were driven by terrorists, Iranians in his point of view, okay? Mm -hmm. There's no difference. That um, could never have the technology to build these kind of machines, mm -hmm. he said. You know, I mean, th this, is, this is what we're dealing with, you see. You know this mm -hmm. better than I, you know? Um, and so, yes, it's, up, it, it's important that th those of us who have some kind of say challenge that horrific way of, of, of approaching um, history. Now, part of it, I could say, is it's, it's, it's mythology. It's still part of the same mythology of Thermopylae and Marathon and Salamis that, that Herodotus is doing. But you see, if you take that to the extreme, mm. and that's what we've got in 300, that's how dangerous that mythology can be. And I go on the web um, and look up, you know, there are lots of far-right um, societies that utilize classical imagery, mm. classical ideology. Mm -hmm. So that battle between East and West, with the Persians being barbarized, and the Persians representing everything, which is the antithesis of freedom, whatever that means, mm -hmm. is still being used. Mm. And that's why, you know, it's not simply a, a little Hollywood fantasy. It's a dangerous piece of work, I think, 300. Not but actually, of my people, I thank you. But that actually makes me think of, um, so, there's a particular book called uh, Destiny Disrupted um, by Tamim Ansari, and it's a history of what he calls um, the, the Middle World, um, which is how he frames the Middle East from the time of um, Muhammad to the present day. This actually I used as an initial starting point when I realized how little I knew about Islam before I started writing this, like Victoria. But, but what I love about it is it's kind of the inverse of um, historical fiction. It's creative nonfiction, and it's this incredibly funny, witty, rollicking read that is incredibly precise at the same time. And I was thinking about this because in terms of, you know, the idea of them not having the technological capabilities, I'm like, uh, do, we, do we know where, like, 
our technology and history and all that kind of stuff? Like, do we do we understand the origin things like maths and all this knowledge? Does it really come from the Wetley? There's there's a there's a real deficit of understanding about how how ultimately integrated uh, the whole world is. And I one thing I wanted to to add because I really appreciate just in general, like I said, the the fact that you are you know really starting to bring like the, the Persian perspective. I think well well a plurality of perspectives that you know allow us to look at these things more richly. I think to me, it's, it's been very important to, when you, when you have a, whether it's a people or a community or whatever that, that do not have the kind of agency on the global stage to sort of articulate themselves as they would want to, it becomes really important to interrogate uh, the narratives that ultimately reaffirm like the existing power, right? And I think to myself, I want to get to a point, and we you know, probably aren't there yet with a lot of, you know, sort of the most marginalized um, communities in terms of like public narratives where we just need, even need to get um, narratives that just knock back the really nefarious ones we have. But I want to get to a point where we can, and, and you've been talking about this anyway, you know, accept the, the complexities, the, 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 whether it's corruption, whether it's, you know, um, all of the ways in which people and humans are terrible and they abuse power without that then sticking to and becoming a narrow confirmation that this is all that they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of, you know, and as I said, the, the, the you know, great granddaughter of uh, the Kajars, we still talk, but not about the book. Um, but it was important to me that people, that we, that we allow our stories to show the breadth of humanity and all of the ways in which we are kind of proud and terrible and long for power. And, you know, I guess when I interrogate these things, I think, well, what, what do we owe each other? What are we supposed, how are we meant to be engaging with each other? How are we meant to use narrative? What does it mean for people to say, um, don't take this story away from us because it's this vainglorious story, but it's all they have because all the other stories are being, you, you know, what are we, how should we understand the, the impact, the power of, of narrative mm -hmm. and what it does? And those are kinds of the questions that I think, um, that I really think we should all, we obviously are, but, but people should be asking. And also I think a, a really vital way to get more people into things like history. Historical fiction is very fun for me to write, but I, I mean, it's very hard to use in some ways, but I think I'm so often like troubled just by how little we know about history, how, how siloed off are, as you say, about, you know, I'm beneficiary of the English private school classic system, like, phew, goodness knows what we learned. But I really think there is a need to get people into a broader way of understanding history and recognizing mm. uh, global history. And I think, yeah, interrogating what we owe each other and what we, yeah, what we owe the world and how we understand and analyze, um, yeah, the, the things we're told from Frank Miller and the rest. I was very aware that when I was writing Persians that essentially it was going to go to two audiences. It was going to go to Iranians and non-Iranians, you know, as polarised as that. And I, I hope that for the non-Iranians they'll just realise that there's this wonderful, rich and very important story that comes from Iran. For Iranians within and outside of Iran, I hope that they'll have the confidence to see that their, their, their history is a genuine, it makes a genuine contribution to, to, to world history, mm. that they have their place, and they don't actually need to fixate on things like myths of, of um, human, uh, human rights from Cyrus, because what's there is enough. Mm. You, you've got a great history, which is part of a world culture, you know? Um, by all means, you know, keep that story going if you want to, but also recognize that there's a much bigger history of Iran which is worthy of telling. And I think that's for the, the main thing for me. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from, um, hello there. Or there's someone just coming down to you with a microphone, Sara. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd mentioned he'd like to hear more of ethnic narratives from the Persian Empire. What sort of ethnic groups were there in the Persian Empire? Well, you can imagine with an empire that size, the diversity is, is absolutely enormous. Yeah. Um, and work is being done on um, different parts of the empire and how they receive their Persianization, how far they go with it, how far they work with the central authorities, and how far they're allowed or even break away from the central authorities. So 
much good work has been done, especially in, in Asia Minor, for instance, where we have a lot of really good um, sources, as well as in Egypt. And Egypt was all, always problematic for the Achaemenids. Um, they needed it because it was the breadbasket of the world. Um, it was a rich, rich holding. But Egypt broke away once from the empire for a good 60 years and had to be reconquered, which says that all is not well in the Persian Empire all of the time. Um, it's much harder to get a hold on things that are happening in the eastern part of the empire, in Afghanistan, northern India, because our sources there, unfortunately, are really, really piecemeal. Um, and this is the trouble with, with ancient history generally, but Persian history in particular, is that we, we get lots of material um, from the west, so from Asia Minor and especially, of course, from Greece. And that kind of creates a narrative, which is actually quite a false narrative. We've got, we've got more of the empire to go, and lots more of the empire to go, but it's much harder to pick out the sources from those areas. So um, I think it is possible to write an ethnic approach um, because, you know, uh, ethnicity is, is a huge thing for the, for the ancient Persians. At Persepolis, there are amazing images of all the peoples of the empire who come and bring their gifts, their diplomatic gifts, to the, to the great king. What I'm interested in, in is, okay, if you come from Ethiopia and you see yourself on that, 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 that staircase being, um, you know, in, in your relief, what's your attitude to it? Are you thinking, yes, I'm joyfully coming here to give my gift to the king? Or, you know, I do not see myself there. That is not who I am. Um, that's the kind of questions we need to start moving with, penetrating into. Not easy to answer, but the questions themselves, I think, are worth asking. Thank you very much. We just have a couple more minutes. There's one more question from uh, the gentleman here in the second row. It's Lloyd. Um, Bridget and I went with you to Iran about, I can't remember now, five years, yeah. maybe longer. Um, one of the things as a ceramicist that I took away from going to the uh, National um, Museum in Tehran was the quality and the breadth of the ceramics, particularly the evidence, obviously, of the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And it's much later than the period that, that you specialise in. But I just thought that was, that was quite, quite revealing, quite amazing, actually. And the quality was just absolutely stunning. That's the first thing. The second th memory that I've got is when, w when you took your roses to the tomb of Cyrus and you sprinkled the roses and the reception of local tourists to that was quite interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. When I, when I visit Cyrus's tomb, I often offer my respect as well. But, you know, the Cyrus's tomb has become the centre of a kind of nationalist revival of the past. Mm -hmm. So in 2016... An estimated 30,000 people turned up at Cyrus's tomb, and they started to perambulate around it as they do the Kaaba in Mecca, shouting uh, "Kurush Davud," you know, "Long live Cyrus, long live Cyrus." Uh, and 29th of October has been named the National Cyrus Day. It's it's not a recognised um, uh, holiday by the government, and of course, it's getting a lot of people into a lot of trouble. But it's really interesting to see how. Um, the ancient past is being reactivated by particularly young Iranians. And we should remember that Iran has got the youngest demographic in the world. Um, um, majority, I think 70% of people are under the age of 50 um, or 40 maybe. 40, 40 yeah. I think you might be right. Yeah, yeah. very, very young. And it, it's ripe to change. Things are going to happen, you know. Um, octogenarian mullahs immediately condemned, you know, what are you doing walking around this as though it were the Kaaba? In the old days, they used to shout, long live the Shah, and now you're doing it for Cyrus. Um, the Shah himself had used Cyrus, of course, you know, in big time, big sort of propaganda thing. So it's interesting that, that how the Achaemenid past is being reactivated. I always say to my students, studying ancient history is not a dead subject. It's alive and vital and, and really matters in this world. And I think in Iran, you see it more than anywhere else right now. Thank you. Is there another burning question, or can I finish with one final question and wrap us up for today? Hello. Yes, someone down here in the front. Thank you so much. That was brilliant, brilliant panel. What I love about In the Palace of Flowers is what you said, telling the forgotten stories. And I really want to delve into your work and understand the whole mythology piece. Where's the tipping point? When are these stories no longer going to be forgotten? And how do we get there, both in, in fiction, in nonfiction? And what can we do to support that? Thank you. Best yeah. question, save to last. Like, like, yeah, huge question. Uh, OK, how, uh, I think it's about. <laughs> 
normalizing these stories, you know? It's no more, it's, it's not seeing them as Orientalist tropes. I called one of my books Tales of the Orient because I want to stamp that out entirely, you know? They're just, they're, they're part of a, of a, a story process of, of global histories. When do we get there? I don't know. We have a long way to go with the history of Iran. But the more we can do this kind of thing, the more there are, you know, radio programs and like, very good things that Samira Ahmed did on, on the BBC, uh, Art of Persia, um, the, the more liberating, um, liberated Persia will become from a, from, a, from a Western narrative. And that's all we can hope for, I think. The other thing, um, and I, I, I agree with that, I definitely do, and it, I think that also it, there's got to be a kind of a broader uh, cultural shift in how we how we think of storytelling. So I think of now like the, um, I think it's the Man International Booker Prize that like respects like translation as well. And it's about also really kind of, the, the way in which you change any kind of state is ultimately you have to dilute the state that you already have, right? So there has to be a kind of, um, a, a, a recognition that we need to really bring into um, our understanding of the main stories, a multiplicity, a, a, a transnational, um, set of narratives and also ultimately different languages, right? And so I think, um, you know, there's a particular writer, um, Ngugi Wathiongo, and he writes, and I've forgotten the name of it, oh, something torn and new. And it's basically about the way in which you get, for example, post-colonialism in Africa, which he doesn't believe we have because he's saying, you're not, you're still speaking in like colonial languages. And I think that a really big part of any sort of change will be bringing, you know, it, it starts with bringing translation and bringing, you know, recognizing the innate international nature of stories, right? And, and even, you know, to the things we were talking about earlier on, the way the history that we are taught in schools needs to be global. It needs to recognize that it's way more integrated right from the beginning. You know, there's no British history different from world history. And so the moment you start recognizing that we are really in connected as your starting point and have that in your stories and your fiction and your nonfiction, that's when it becomes much more organic to see this change because it doesn't feel like something radical or something that's marginalizing people who are used to feeling like they're in the center because actually we're all part of the same whole and making that cent you know, central to how we tell stories is gonna be how we get there is, is what I think, is what I hope anyway. You know, just to, just to finish off on that, um, students come to, to read ancient history at, at Cardiff University when I was at Edinburgh and I offer courses on Persia and the, and the ancient Near East. They don't know they want those courses when they arrive, but they leave loving them um, and very often, you know, they come because they think it's going to be about Greece and Rome, and they can do as much of that as they like. But also now, we offer this huge new level of, of engagement with the ancient Middle East as well. Uh, you know, when people go away and they start doing MAs in it, and now we're writing PhDs in it, and we have to do all of that. And I'm delighted to say that now Persia has been part, is now part of the GCSE syllabus in ancient history, and there's also going to be a, a, an A-level section uh, of uh, ancient history as well with Amazing. Persia rooted into it. Amazing. So it's a good start. It's a very good start. Thank you. That is brilliant. And, you know, I was thinking about what you said about in Iran, they don't teach <coughs> Persian uh, history of the empire. And actually, that's what we need in this country as well about the British yeah. empire. Absolutely. That's not done yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, which is quite, uh, mm. quite, really quite shocking. <laughs> um, my last question, very briefly, about a subject that's very close to my heart, Lloyd. Um, my brother told me this. I want to know if it's true. <laughs> is it true that the first evidence of beer making was found on, a, on Iranian soil. You are right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank it's you Silak Tepe, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. About 4,000 BC, yeah. Absolutely. I'll give the Iranians that. that. Yeah. We invented beer. <laughs> um, Thank you so much to Victoria and to Lloyd, who will be outside uh, signing their books uh, as soon as we leave, I think. I think so. Thank you very much uh, for you guys for being here, and thank you so much for HisFest for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.